Thank you all for showing up. Um, first off, who are we? Uh, I'm Dougal Johnson. Down in the front row are Damon Stacey, Theo Julian, and Carla Burnett. We're a bunch of university students who like to hack. We like figuring out how things work. We find systems really interesting. So on to the inevitable disclaimer. Um, we did this as a research exercise. We weren't in this to profit or to make fake train tickets or anything like that. Um, Travelling without a valid ticket is illegal, but I know a lot of these talks cover things which, if you do maliciously, would be illegal. This is kind of a new kind of illegal because you're making fraudulent documents, so it comes under a whole bunch of fraud laws as well as the normal computer laws that we tend to think about. The views are entirely our own. We don't represent any corporations or organisations or companies, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah. Um, we talk to the company that makes these tickets and as such, we can't actually show you the algorithm that they use. Um, it's still in use and they don't want you having it. <laughs> on the other hand, on the other hand, we've been very careful to keep the method that we use to reverse engineer it the same. So hopefully you'll leave this talk with all the skills that you would need to do it yourselves. That said, <laughs> That said, don't do it, <laughs> don't profit from it, don't use your skills for evil, um, it would break a whole lot of laws. Uh, it's going to be a very introductory talk, and so I'm going to start with talking a little bit about what reverse engineering is. Reverse engineering is all about figuring out how something was designed. Um, you wanna, you've got a system that someone else has made, you need to understand how it works. Um, it's used a lot in hacking stuff that's not open source, people who want to find bombs in Windows or Internet Explorer. Um, and this is white box reverse engineering. Um, white box reverse engineering is where you have access to the implementation. You can disassemble it, you can look inside it. Um, uh, and yeah, we use it for malware um, because you, know, you get your computer infected, you disassemble it, you break it down, you simulate it, whatever. And in a sense, it's always possible. There are a few edge cases where something might self-destruct or a server goes down, but you can always dive in and you can usually watch it do what it does. It covers a lot of areas, um, like dynamic analysis, which is debuggers, system call, traces, library call traces, all sorts of cool stuff. You can do fun stuff with virtual machines. Also static analysis, which is disassemblers, decompilers, all sorts of really, really cool research happens in this area. Um, but we're not talking about that today. We're talking about black box reverse engineering. So black box reverse engineering is a bit different because you can use the implementation, but you can't see what's going on inside. Um, and we use this often for file formats, network protocols, and magnetic stripes. It's not necessarily possible. You know, there's all these concepts of perfect encryption. You could be looking at something that's been encrypted with a one-time pad, and it's literally impossible. Um, but it's often possible. Often there's enough, and there's a lot less noise. There's a lot less stuff to sift through. Um, and it's, you need to analyze systems and data. So you need to analyze systems to figure out where you can put data in and where you can get data out so you know what's going on. You need to analyze the data you get out so you can figure out what's actually happening in the black box. That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I really like black box reverse engineering um, uh, because it's often a lot easier than white box reverse engineering. So in this contrived example, I've got shown on the right, um, sorry, on the left, I've got black box reverse engineering. I'm just trying to figure out how many arguments this program takes. On the right, I've got all of the assembly code that you would need to understand to figure out that this program only takes two arguments. It's often good to go to the effort of understanding the assembly, because looking at the demonstration on the left, you can't tell that it doesn't also accept 80 arguments. But at the same time, it's a lot easier to just dive in with the black box approach, even when you have the choice. In this case, we're going to be looking at magnetic stripe tickets from a mass transit ticketing system. Mass transit ticketing, um, trains, buses, trams, whatever. 
Um, and these are magnetic strike tickets, so they have a stream of data encoded on them. Um, we, yeah, used a magnetic stripe reader to read that data off, and we wanted to figure out what that magnetic stripe data meant, its significance. So, which tickets? Um, yeah, there are a lot of questions on this slide. How much data and which data? Um, we wanted a really large data set uh, because the more data you have, the more you can figure out from it. There's not really such a thing as too much data. If you have too much, you can just ignore some of it and look at a subset. But we also wanted a sort of very high precision data set, a very small amount of data that could answer very specific questions, data that we knew everything about. Um, so yeah, here's Damon to talk about analyzing that smaller data set. Okay, so when you're looking at your data set, you really gotta work out what would you store in the system. If you're looking at a transit system that's for trains, you're gonna have a destination place and, uh, and a, possibly a source. You might have the price of the ticket, you might have all of these different things that you have to store in the ticket, otherwise it's useless to their system to validate whether or not it's the right ticket. So look for common things that you'd see within the data, uh, and how would you encode it? Um, I'll just move on quickly to, okay. <laughs> um, looking at data, um, if you've got, we've just gotten a file and piped in random data and look for a pattern, just comparing sequential nibbles of data within the file and just made it a 2D uh, heat map, I suppose. Um, and it does look very green, but there is some discrepancies. Um, that's what random data looks like. Now, if you had AES encryption, encrypted data, you would have something very much the same. It looks almost random. On our case, for example, though, this is what we look found. So clearly, we're not working with, we're not working with strong encryption. It's a very broken system that you can, we could work out. So modern cryptography will look like random data. Um, so we'll compress data. If you compress something, you're gonna have, say you've got a string of five A's in your data. If you compress that, you just express it in some expression of five A's. And it's gonna look significantly more random because you'll have a single ID for the same pattern that's different in between. Five A's will look very different to five D's. So, yeah, apply frequency analysis to whatever data set you're looking at and see what comes out. If it's strong encryption, then consider other methods. Um, so yeah, our general observations were that we needed to store validity somehow. So at the end date, possibly a start date, the origin, destination, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but also looking at the tickets themselves, t the tickets had physical card IDs. That's likely to be stored on there. Um, they might have pictures or any kind of thing, prices that are stored on the ticket. So take notes of these things when you start because you'll forget them later on when you're trying to work out what data is stored there. So we started by specially purchasing three tickets from Mayfair at 557 and 557 and 558 and we got very different data. It was not clear that we were, what we were looking at was unencoded. So we tried to look for patterns and we've got this nice long string of ones, sixes and Bs. Personally I'd like to zero that because just extra data and we've got all these other patterns that are found throughout it. So we decided that XOR would be a good way to look at this and zero those fields. So XORing would zero that and then when we compared the three tickets applying the same XOR, so XOR with one if that string was one, six if it was six, and we have three pieces of data that look very similar, two almost identical, and the first different. So there's something else going on here, but we know and almost immediately that we've got an XOR encryption. XOR is used somehow to encrypt this, these things because it's just making the pattern significantly too obvious. So we decided to look at the correlations between the nibbles that are present. So when we saw a four, it was a one. When we saw a uh, seven, it was a seven, et cetera, et cetera. So looking at the binary, we saw 
just looking at this set, we've got, for each of those cases, we've got the same number of ones in the starting position and the end position. So we've got a really simple cipher here. Um, does anybody know what it is? Just put up your hands if you know what it is. No? Okay. This is a simple roll right, or roll left. Um, nice and simple, and you apply it to the tickets, and we have, rolling them, uh, we have three tickets that look almost identical. So we now have the key to deciphering these tickets. We can make three tickets that are almost identical look identical, therefore we've got the methods that they use, or approximately the methods. So then, looking for more patterns, these worked on our three tickets that we specially bought, but applying this to our data set, which we collected something like a thousand tickets, um, it just didn't work. Tickets that we expected to look the same, had the same destinations, about the same time, looked completely different. So we tried XORing with other things. We know XOR is a cipher, so try XORing with the fourth, eighth, fifteenth, twenty-third, forty-second nibble. It made some of the data set look the same. Some of the data set from certain stations looked the same. Sometimes the times were about right, but it never quite worked. So we've got the keys. Now we just need to work out the specific details. So here's Theo, who talked about data sets. So um, we saw in the previous examples a uh, small data set of specific tickets that we purchased. Um, we know most of the ticket fields on those three tickets will be the same because they were purchased at the same station, they were purchased at the same time. But the large data set has a wide space of possible values. They're purchased from many, many different uh, locations and it gives us a lot more information about the system. That's clearly what we need. Um, there's much less correlation in the large data set than there is in the small data set, obviously. Um, and having a, a large data set lets us validate uh, our theories about how the data would be encoded as well, because uh, as we can see before, it was very easy to make three tickets look the same, but once you expand that to a large data set, it, that doesn't work. And so you can verify your uh, decryption algorithms that way. So moving to the large data set, we need a way of gathering the data. So uh, as was mentioned before, it's a magnetic stripe ticketing system. We can purchase tickets from vending machines, uh, but that costs a lot of money uh, because we want a lot of tickets. Uh, but once they're used, they're essentially free. Nobody can use them again. Um, uh, luckily, some of us hoard train tickets, uh, huge amounts of them. So that helped us quite a lot. Um, so the next question is, We've got about a thousand tickets that we've happened to collect from family and friends. How do we digitize that data? We, we can't just look at the physical tickets. We obviously need to have some way of searching through them. Uh, we're going to want to script, uh, write scripts to go through that data and work out correlations and things like that. So we need an efficient way of digitizing that information. Um, we'll use manual labor to do that. Uh, it's pretty much the only way. Uh, it took us about an afternoon to do this. The way we did it was using a Lego rig, amusingly enough, which I have right here. <laughs> a nice little thing that you can just stick on your laptop. Uh, not that one. Hold on. That one. Nicely aligns the, uh, the ticket. This is just an iTunes gift card, sorry. We can't show the real one. Uh, we just stick the ticket in there. We swipe the ticket through a uh, magstripe reader. Our script collects the data off the ticket. Then we stick the ticket in here, press the key on the keyboard, it will take a picture, nice and clearly getting the whole uh, physical printed data on the ticket. And then we just stored the uh, image with the file name of the actual raw hex that was stored on the ticket itself. And that gives us a nice way of going through later on. We can be looking at the data and then wonder whether we've decoded the data correctly or whatever, and we can look at the physical image and see what it actually uh, said on the ticket. So that was pretty cool. Now if I can get back to the presentation somehow. Um, so obviously, so we've seen how to manually look through small uh, data sets and manually manipulate, that's what we were doing. We took the tickets, we had them in a text editor, we made some guesses, it's using XOR, we think we'll XOR with this value. Um, 
we write little Python one-liners to translate it. Um, that worked fine for three tickets, doesn't work for a thousand tickets. We need to automate it. Our brains can only sit, uh, consider bite-sized pieces of information, so when we have three tickets like that, we can just think about the whole, of, uh, all the data on those three tickets, we can visualize everything about it, we can work out what we might want to do next. When you have a thousand tickets, you can't do that anymore. It's, 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 it's too much. Uh, you need some way of uh, scripting it, getting the computer to do a lot of that work for you. So moving into the full data set, we need much more automation, and we can't do it by hand. So scripting. If we group our data, uh, by this stage we've got all the tickets in a database, um, we group our data by the known fields which we read off the physical tickets. We can easily check for correlations, or at least we would be able to if the data was completely decrypted, but we don't know how it's decrypted yet. So what do we do with the encrypted data? Well, you're in luck if it's a weak encryption, like we have in this case. Um, we can just brute force it. Uh, there's not that much data on the ticket. It's a weak encryption. Yeah, easy enough to brute force. So our plan now is to find the origin station given the partially decoded data that we have or the rough algorithm that we have. Uh, we know that XOR is the key to this algorithm because it produces such good results on the three tickets that we had, but we don't know how the XOR is being used and we also had the role. We don't know how the role actually works as a generalized algorithm. We just know that it's used somewhere in it. So taking XOR as the idea, we'll iterate through all the possible uh, values on the ticket that we could use as the XOR key rather than just the one in the long string like we had on the previous examples. Um, and except the computers are fast enough to go through all the possible combinations. The tickets are 50 characters or something in length, those nibbles in length. Um, so we can just iterate through them. What we want to do, though, is output something that visually lets us look at the correlation. So the computer is great at going through a massive data set, but it's not as good at working out where something actually correlates in that data. So we'll use uh, just simple visualizations, which I'll show you now, like this, so that we can then look at the output from the program and clearly see when there is a correlation between the data. So on this example, you can see where there are underscores there. That means there's no correlation. On the left, You'll see 11, 12, and 13. They are the nibble that we are using to XOR the entire string width. And it was just iterating through every single possible nibble. You can see then the station there, uh, and then the correlations for that station, for every ticket that we had for that station. And you can see on, num on 12 in the middle there, there are clearly three, t three nibbles there that for every uh, ticket with that origin station, it had those three nibbles in that position. And you can see then it deteriorates once you get to the next position and so on. That's very clear just to look at that as you're scrolling through it, um, it comes up. Um, that's pretty awesome because if someone comes up to us with a ticket and we've seen the ticket from that origin station before, we can just swipe it and then tell them which origin station without looking at the ticket at all. It's a really cool party trick. <laughs> uh, so obviously we can repeat that for the destination station as well. Um, the values for the uh, origin station and the destination station fields were different. Um, that's not entirely surprising because we don't know the algorithm yet. We only know that it's using XOR, roughly. Um, we eventually found out that just rolling some of those nibbles would actually make them the same. So uh, there's clearly some sort of combination of XOR and rolling going on there, but we're not quite sure what. Um, obviously, the, the most interesting thing now to get off the ticket is the date and time, or at least the date, because that's uh, crucial to the validity of the tickets. So to start with, um, there's a big difference between the origin station type of field and the date field when you're trying to reverse it. The downside to the date field is over our data set, we have many, many less tickets with the same date values because they're distributed over a large period of time. Whereas obviously, because it was a small group of people who were collecting these tickets, uh, we had a lot of um, tickets with the same origin station and the same destination station commuting and that sort of thing. Um, so what we'll do is pretty much the same as before. We analyze data from any date in our data set that has more than two samples, so we can actually see if there is a correlation, and we'll allow for some inaccuracy there just because the uh, reading physical tickets is a bit uh, prone to error, I guess. That's the output. So uh, on the left, again, you'll see A, me, is the nibble that we're uh, XORing the string with the date that we're looking at. 
And then again, the underscores represent no correlation, and pretty clearly there, we're, again, we've got the date in those four nibbles there. So every ticket on that date had those four nibbles. Um, so a contrast to the downside of having less data per day, like I said before, we have an upside for the date field, which is that we have a much better guess at how that field is encoded. The station IDs for the origin and destination stations are probably just database identifiers or something like that. There's not gonna be a clear pattern. They can be added and removed, that sort of thing. Whereas the date field is very likely just to be an incrementing field, um, probably incrementing each day. And we can probably guess if it's doing that, that's got some start date that some huge expensive proprietary program will use like SQL server and that uses 1900 first to the first. So we can just make guesses like that. Um, what we're trying to do now, of course, is actually work out what's encoded in those four nibbles. Um, because we know that the location of those nibbles, we can use all the samples. We don't have to only look at dates where we have uh, more than one ticket, which is nice. And again, we want to visualize it, um, do the correlations in the code, and then uh, visualize it so that we can just check and uh, see what's happening. And that's what we've got here. Uh, on the left, you can see we've got every date during our, uh, the period that we collected the tickets. Uh, so it's huge, actually, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rows. Um, we've got the date since 19, 1900, sorry. Um, that wasn't actually that useful in this case, but you can see next to that, the four nibbles uh, that were encoded in the date field uh, listed there with the number of tickets that uh, had those four nibbles there. Now, uh, there are some missing ones there. That's just we had no tickets on those days. Um, interestingly, we occasionally uh, came across ones with, where we had two possible values for those four nibbles. Uh, that was a bit unexpected, but it turned out when we just went back and looked at all the tickets on that day, sure enough, we just, human error, entered one of them wrong. It was pretty cool. We could go back and uh, verify that one of them was entered wrong and update our database, and then it was perfect. Um, what's interesting to see here is that as we're incrementing the day, one per line, you can see the last nibble, the one closest to me here, is changing on every single line as you go down. The nibble next to that is constant for a while, and then it changes, and it's constant for a while. And then the other two nibbles are just the same. When we just scroll through the data, we could fairly clearly see that the lowest nibble was changing on every line, the second one was in fact changing every 16, the third one was changing every 256. So although they're not incrementing, it's fairly clear that it is actually an incrementing field. Um, that's pretty clear from that, but it's not decoded yet. So decryption. We have these patterns. How do we convert them into the incrementing field that we expect to be in there? There's really no magic. We're expecting that it's using XOR. So we can um, basically just work out which character we have to XOR the nibbles with in order to get the value that we expect. Um, in this case, you can just take the, the value for the zeroth one, something like that. Um, so we take a, a set of 16 sequential days that we have as much data as we can. Uh, they'll have the same high nibbles, that's what we're looking for, so we'll try and work out the lowest nibble for that. And again, we're just gonna look at how to make that go from zero to F, because that's what we are expecting it to have. And yes, that turns out to be fairly simple. We just find that value somewhere in the ticket and it turned out it was there. Um, that worked for the least significant nibble. It happened to be the nibble uh, right before it. As for the other nibbles though, didn't quite work. We had to do lots of special cases and roll some of the nibbles. And in the end, we could actually work out that it was a number of days since 1970, but it was a really horrible algorithm. Like 10 lines of code with special cases saying, if this bit is set to something, then do some rolling here and that sort of stuff. So it wasn't what we really wanted, but it did give us the date field, which was pretty cool. Cool, so now we're gonna take a brief digression from the case study to talk about Occam's razor, which I'm sure many of you have heard of before, but it's pretty much the idea that the simplest solution to a problem is probably the right one. Um, so this is really applicable in black, black box reverse engineering, because usually you're looking at a set of data and you know that it's only got a finite amount of space in which to store the values you need. Um, realistically, most solutions are gonna be fairly similar because of that, because again, you've only got a finite amount of space and a finite amount of data. It's not like someone can go off and add a heap of padding at the end for no reason, because you know the size of the data. Um, 
The other thing is that most people have fairly similar views in computer science on how to implement problems. You don't want lots of edge cases because they're hard to test. You don't want anything like that. So pretty much if you think it's too complicated, it probably is. Um, you want to go for a solution, you want to look for a solution, that's the sort of thing that you would write. Um, so yeah, keep it simple, stupid, pretty much. <laughs> um, so in our case, we generalized the algorithm over the whole ticket. So applying it to all the tickets we'd seen, again, we had way too many edge cases here. We had like random numbers, um, like 10, 12, 24. They were just at apparently random locations throughout the ticket. We also had a couple of weird things that didn't really make sense. So when we looked at the ticket and where we were zoring, we noticed that sometimes we zored two nibbles that were right next to each other. And we tended to consider that when we were looking at a zored nibble, the value after that, uh, the value of the actual zored nibble wasn't relevant because it would always become zero. Um, so that didn't really make sense if you had two next to each other because then you just have a piece of data that's being wasted. So what we tried to do was extrapolate what we'd seen to our entire ticket. So rather than just zoring with random positions, we zored each nibble with the one next to it. Um, this was pretty cool because it ended up working out this generalized algorithm. We also took a look at the rolled nibbles and it was based on a certain bit, which was, again, pretty cool. <laughs> um, so once, you've, once we were pretty sure we decoded the data, we needed to figure out what the fields that were left actually were. Um, so again, we tried to think about what had to be on the ticket. So because of the way the system worked, we knew we needed start date, we needed end date, origin, destination. We also needed a couple of things, like you could tell in the system whether or not you were traveling on a concession ticket or not. So you needed to store that kind of information as well. Um, we also tried to look at the common methods of storing the data. So we took a look at other systems. For example, there was um, the Boston train hack, sorry, tram hack, I think it was, um, a couple of years ago, where they went off and presented at DEF CON for that. Um, but yeah, we took a look at that and how they'd stored their data and tried to apply it to our own ticketing system. Um, also really useful are documented systems. Not so much in this case, but if you were reversing a file format, if you've got another similar format that's well documented, say it's open source, then you want to look at how they're doing things as well and see if you can bring the way they do things into your own system. Because again, most solutions to a problem are quite similar. Um, and again, extrapolating. So when we took a look at our tickets, we saw that the days were incrementing. We suspected that they might also store the time. So again, the logical way to store the time if you've got incrementing days is going to be an incrementing field as well. Um, we also tried to group our data by known values. So we've already talked about how we did that for the origin and destination stations and for the date. We also did it for um, other kinds of things, things you wouldn't necessarily expect. So we did it for price, we did it for stupid things like the slogan on the back, because we just wanted to figure out whether or not this data could possibly be on the ticket. Um, another thing that you can do when you're reverse engineering is you can change the values that you control. So there's two ways of doing this. The first way is to just play around with the data and then stick it into the implementation you've got and see what it does. It's not applicable here because it's unethical to test on a live system without the permission of the company that owns it. Um, but what you can do, <laughs> what you can do, um, you can do it obviously if you're going to look at a file format. Say you were trying to reverse um, a Word document, you could just change some values and see what changed in the actual thing. You want to try and use a scientific approach though. So you only want to change one thing and try and see exactly what changes from that. You want to control effectively. Um, you can also change the values you know in a way that was ethical in this system, which is if you have a file format, for example, change one thing in the file, save it, and see what changes in the representation. So in our case, we did that when we bought specific tickets from station, the same station, used them the same number of times, that kind of thing. That was our way of controlling data and seeing what changed. Um, there are also a couple of things that are quite difficult to detect when you're trying to figure out certain fields. So for example, checksums are really, really annoying to figure out because they're just this field that changes apparently randomly because they're designed to magnify small changes. So you might have some idea that it's a checksum field, but you can't be entirely certain that you just have a piece of the system that you don't understand. Um, other things that are quite hard to detect are things like version numbers because they can seem constant. Um, until you change to a different version and then suddenly the data changes drastically. Um, also, you can obviously have padding and redundancy, which just seem to be constant values as well. So yeah, when we were looking for our checksum in this data, 
we were pretty certain that we had this one nibble that was the checksum. But again, it was changing randomly, and we just weren't really sure. Um, we took a look at a heap of quite popular checksums. So we took a look at like the LUN checksum that they use on credit cards. Um, we took a look at things like cipher block chaining. We took a look at some really, really complex checksums. I learned more about them than I've ever wanted to know. <laughs> but yeah, in the end, it turned out that we were just looking at the wrong representation of the data. Because when we were looking for a checksum, we were doing it on the unencrypted data, on the unencrypted data, whereas the checksum actually applied on the data before it was decrypted, and it was just zoring all the encoded nibbles together to give f because these people really liked zor. <laughs> so yeah, once we'd done that, we made a really pretty picture, <laughs> just to demonstrate what's on there. So you can see that um, you've got the slogan number, which why you even have that on a ticket, I don't know. Um, you have like the ticket type, the scan status every piece of information that you would need. And this made our party trick really, really awesome, because now I could tell you everything you wanted to know about a ticket. Um, there were also some interesting things. So data that wasn't on the actual physical ticket was often on the mag stripe. For example, when you bought a specific sort of ticket, it didn't print the origin station on the front of the ticket, but it was actually encoded on there, which was cool, because again, you could get more information than the ticket itself told you. Um, we also had a series of special tickets that looked different to the others. Um, you can see that they've clearly got the same sorts of patterns. So they've got that long run of twos, the pair of twos at the start, the pair of Bs at the end. They're quite similar, but when we tried just trimming the data to the um, A at the beginning, it didn't actually work when we decoded it. It gave ridiculous values that just weren't correct. Um, we tried a heap of different encoding methods after that. So again, we just trimmed off the eight and all the zeros and the one. We tried zoring up with constants because Again, tried soaring. Um, we tried uh, adding random values to it. We tried subtracting stuff. We tried a heap of different things, and we just couldn't figure out what it was. Um, in the end, we did some data analysis one afternoon. So we took a look at it, and most of the values seemed to be what we would expect on the right ticket. So what we did was we took the values on the front of it, and we encoded the ticket we would expect from that, and then we compared the two. We found that most of the things were correct. But for some reason, the value seemed to be twice what we'd expect with the lower bit randomly set. It wasn't like it was set to a 1 all the time or a 0 all the time. It just seemed to be random. Um, so in this case, I sat there struggling with this for a while. Theo happened to walk in, and I described what I'd said. And he was like, oh, it's just bit shifted right by 1. Um, so it kind of shows the value of working on a team, because in this case, I worked on it for far too long before he just walked in and told me the answer. Um, and it was also interesting because it was actually just an artifact of the way we'd scanned the tickets. So when we, when we used our magnetic stripe reader, it took the binary data and encoded it to hex, um, encoded, <laughs> grouped it into hex nibbles, which meant that the data that would have looked very, very similar if you looked at it in binary looked completely different because it was offset by one bit. Um, so yeah, again, make sure to look at your data in different formats. Finally, we have some stuff on information leaks. So these are really cool when you're reverse engineering because information leaks make your job a lot easier. If you don't have to find out the answer, if they'll tell it to you in whatever form, then um, again, you don't have to do anywhere near as much work. So when you're looking for information leaks, you want to think about what you can possibly access. So obviously, you're going to be able to access things like websites. Perhaps you'll be able to access known implementations. Um, so again, looking at other transit systems in this case. Um, you might also be able to access the previous versions of something. So if you have a piece of software that's now proprietary but used to be open source, people usually don't rewrite stuff from scratch. So you can go take a look at the older version of it and see what you can bring from that into the new version of the system. Um, another thing that you should do is take a look at the history of the system. So go look on the website. Even if there's no explicit data on it, see how they view their system. Um, see what they consider to be important, what they think is not important. Um, you can also take a look at things like significant ordering, obviously. So if you have a file format, say you're looking at an implementation and you can select values from a drop-down box, the order in the drop-down box is often going to be the order in the actual data format because people aren't trying to hide that information. They don't see it as important. Um, and it's really annoying to randomize that kind of thing. You'll piss off your users unless it's done in a deterministic way. Um, so yeah. Also worth thinking about is trying to infer what's there, so see what they don't say on the website. Um, and yeah, obviously you want to see, if you've got offsets or outliers in your data, you want to try and figure out why those are there. So some cool things for our system 
um, were, as we've already said, the physical serial numbers on the front of the ticket at, actually match the fields on the magnetic stripe itself. Um, really cool, though, was that the physical ticket IDs could be split at, I think, the fourth or fifth digit to give a machine ID and the actual ticket number, which was just incrementing. The machine ID is individual for each machine, and really coolly, rail enthusiasts go out and buy these tickets and write down which machine is at every single station and where it's ever been, and that kind of thing, which means that you can then go and validate whether or not a ticket is valid based on whether or not the machine has ever been at the origin station, which was pretty cool. <laughs> um, another quite entertaining thing was that the station IDs on these tickets, which originally seemed random, once we decoded it, turned out to just be incrementing when you went down a line, which was good because obviously that's what you'd expect. It's a simple implementation. The useful thing was that they had a um, drop down of all the stations on their site. And if you went and took a look at the source code of that, the JavaScript IDs for each element in that drop down were just a constant offset from the IDs on the ticket themselves which meant that even if we didn't have certain stations, we could actually infer what they were. So ones that were like farther away from our houses, really far out, we could actually guess what they were, which was pretty cool. So yeah, custom cryptography, they used it. <laughs> it. <laughs> it's really not a good idea, but people keep doing it. Um, People, yeah, it, it looks good. It looks, you look at it, it doesn't look like the same ticket you put in, um, but the data is still there, and cryptographers spend a really long time learning about this stuff. It's complicated, it's a lot of maths, and once they've done that, they spend a long time designing things, cryptographic primitives, and then they make them free and available on the internet and people check them out and look over them over and over again and try to find ways to break them. And eventually they fail a lot and then you have good cryptography and you can use it. So in the case of this system, there are probably a few good reasons why they didn't use it. Um, the system was really, really old. We're talking before I was born old. Um, and, okay, not that old. <laughs> but the computing power to implement some of the cryptography which was available then and which would have held up under scrutiny today um, was expensive. You know, you would need real microprocessors doing real things. Looking at this algorithm, which we've hopefully explained fairly well, um, you can actually implement that in about 20 lines of assembly. Um, it's dead simple and it is hiding the data. Uh, it's using cipher block chaining, rolling, it's all, it's all stuff people know how to do and that makes a huge difference. But even with cryptography, which they should have used, um, with strong cryptography, people do keep making silly mistakes. Um, and just in the last talk that was in this room about payment gateways, uh, they were talking about the Flickr problem where they were using, I think it was SHA-1 uh, or SHA-256, one of the SHAs, um, and they just didn't know what that cryptography did. They were using it to sign something. It's not designed for signing. People could do a length extension doesn't work. People keep doing this. People keep um, using MD5. People keep making really, really silly mistakes with cryptography and yeah, learn about it before you use it. So at this point we had actually accounted for every nibble of data on this card we knew enough about the system and its age to know that there was no centralized database verifying these serial numbers. In theory, we could make tickets, and that's bad for a whole bunch of reasons, mostly for them. Um, <laughs> so responsible disclosure. I'll leave it completely up to your ethical model to decide whether or not you want to responsibly disclose the stuff you find. But in this case, we did, um, which is part of why this presentation is less amusing. Um, 
It's really difficult. Um, so we went to their website and we looked around to try to find like a responsible disclosure page. I guess that was hopeful. Um, we found a customer complaints phone number that we called um, and <laughs> we talked to the guy and, we, and we, we said, we'd like to engage in responsible disclosure with your organization. And he said back, we're sorry, we have a policy of not disclosing anything. <laughs> We got an address out of him, and we sent a letter to, to that address. Um, about 20 days later, we got back a response saying that they'd like to meet with us, which I suppose is fair enough. Um, and we met up with them and went through a lot of talks with them. Um, we showed them the slides we were hoping to present um, and agreed on what we could take out of them and what we could leave in. Um, it's really hard to change big systems. This example, they said they'd been trying to change it for a really long time and they knew this attack was possible. It's hard to change. It's, they have implementations in every place that their transport system services. You know, that's a lot of implementations. Um, and yeah, so they're working on changing it. They can't yet. Hopefully they will soon and we can publish our actual research. Um, but yeah, it's really important to know the laws. Um, you don't want to go up to someone and say, hey, so I hacked this thing and I messed this up and I screwed up your database and you should probably put me in prison. <laughs> you need to know what you're doing and you need to not incriminate yourself. Um, and it is important to work with the organization to help them keep their systems secure if you can, um, and to make sure that they're not going to try to sue you. Um, so, yeah, uh, after this, we have a message that they gave us that they would like us to show you. Um, <laughs> Ticket is not valid if it is defaced, mutilated, or altered, so don't draw on your tickets. <laughs> um. <laughs> so, finishing up, um, we, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we can't tell you, and we are sorry about that. Um, we would like to avoid identifying the transport organization um, yeah, okay, you can probably figure it out. But um, we also can't tell you any information about the actual encryption that they used. Um, but if you have any questions for us, we're happy to take them now. Anyone have questions? But it's a cost-risk decision, isn't it? Sorry? It's a, it's a cost-risk decision. If it's going to cost them millions to do it and they only lose 100000 a year, who cares? Yeah. It, Obviously, in the corporate situation, it's very much about finding the best way of doing it. Um, yeah, they're trying to make the change, and yeah, but it does it really does <laughs> take time? When was the last time you guys paid for a ticket? <laughs> We still buy our tickets. Um, a few of my friends who know that we've done this research congratulate me every time they see me buying a ticket. In, in fact, these guys would have bought lots of tickets to actually do the research, so, so they're ahead. Anyone else? When you first met with the transport organisation, what was their reaction when you told them what you'd done? Um, so we went into, we'd given them, we'd sent them a letter which showed, uh, explained what we'd done very roughly um, and included a um, 
the, do you remember the slide showing all the fields? It included that data to illustrate that we knew what we were talking about. So I'm assuming they had time to prepare their response. Um, we went in and we sat down with their CIO, a few subject matter experts, and um, they were, for the most part, very reasonable. Um, obviously, they weren't a huge fan of us giving this presentation, um, but they talked to us. Yeah, no one got too annoyed, I believe. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, the second time they were, they liked to emphasize the risks of what we were doing and explain the laws to us. <laughs> uh, how much time and how much money was spent from coming up with the idea and actually having a result? Okay, so we bought, uh, I think, three magnetic stripe readers in the end. The first magnetic stripe reader was a tiny little thing that probably cost about $20. Um, and that didn't work. It was designed for credit cards and it worked perfectly for those, but it had the uh, text decoding on board. We were looking at the raw data, and so we needed a different reader. Um, we acquired two of the other kind of reader. The first one was for, do you remember how much you paid? 120 bucks. And the second one was for 150 bucks, and they were both the same model of quite heavy duty um, card readers. Um, after that, we probably bought 10 to 20 tickets, especially for the purpose, and those would have been less than $5 each. Um, so, yeah, a few hundred bucks, not too much. It took quite a while, but we're not doing this as a full-time job, so while it was spread out over a number of months, um, the actual work was probably a couple of days doing that initial three ticket analysis, just staring at screenfuls of hex, followed by a day doing the full data digitization stuff, probably another day trying to find a way to get out of it. Um, and after that, just a couple of, there were a couple of nights of just really hard work um, scripting to do the automation steps and identifying the fields was a lot of just scanning the tickets um, under different conditions and brute force work, but probably only a few days spread out over quite a long period. I've got a shorter question. So what state do you live in? <laughs> I'm sure you can figure that out for yourself. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> questions? <laughs> questions? <laughs> Uh, one word question, uh, Mikey. Um, we don't live in this state. Uh, we bought one today and we'll look at it, but from what we've seen, it's probably a good deal stronger than this. I think it wasn't made 20 something years ago. <laughs> Um, there have been some cases where RFID analysis compared to a similar system that uh, provided mag strip uh, data did have a very strong correlation. So, see how you go with that. But you forgot to include the price of the Lego. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, does anyone, you bought it too long ago. Actually, it came from a Lego online store security. It's like $300, but it's. <laughs> So add $300 for the Mindstorms kit and then only use a small amount of it for this. Anything else? One more. How long ago did you disclose uh, this to the transport system? Um, it's actually been fairly recent that we were in meetings with them. It's been about two months before today um, and all the research was done before then. Did you do go legal? So the, quest so the question is, did we go to legal or get legal advice? Um, and the answer is, we probably should have. Um, <laughs> we sat down and read uh, large amounts of legislation and talked to a few people very informally who know a bit more about the law than us, um, but we didn't get any real advice. Um, All right, we do have time for a couple more questions, actually, if anyone else has got any. Oh, there's one fella up the back there. I'm running around. 
making me work. Who was it? Um, do you know if you actually buy, like, are there any laws against reverse engineering, and like, how would those apply to this or other projects? Um, so reverse engineering laws in Australia are pretty great compared to most of the rest of the world. I believe reverse engineering, speaking very generally, um, is protected for interoperability purposes. So if you are working on open office, you get a free pass for reverse engineering Microsoft Word. Um, Reverse engineering is protected on there, would have crossed several physical security lines, like when not allowed to break into their boxes and dump their software. Um, but yeah, in this case, there were no reverse engineering laws preventing us from looking at the data on a ticket we owned and analyzing it in a large database. <laughs> Anything else? Any others? All right, we'll give a big round of applause for the train hack guys. <laughs> <laughs>